Well, unless I am otherwise strongly moved, this is going to be our last talk on the Garden of Eden story. And uh, it's not because I've run out of things to say. In fact, this uh, whole presentation, uh, 15 talks, has been skimpy relative to the material, especially in getting into the nuances of the two poles of evil. And I really invite you to read Rolf Steiner, who has quite a few uh, writings on the two flavors of evil. Next time, we're going to try and very quickly rush through and do uh, Prometheus and Pandora as an alternate version of the Garden of Eden story. Because uh, it, it really does match quite well. I just don't want to stay too long on this subject because if you look at one thing from one point of view too long, you get unbalanced. And I'm inclined to do that anyway. And after a while, it would get pretty tiresome to hear the same kind of things over and over again. However, there are a lot of openings or a lot of hooks so that uh, some of the ideas that were left undeveloped here, if you want to develop them yourself, it is, uh, you know, it's wide open. I'd love to get some feedback when you come up with your own thinking along some of these lines or even not, even contrary to some of these lines. There is going to be one more extension type of talk to this series, and it will be at our little conclave. And it's going to be on uh, it's going to be on sex, sexuality, and spirituality. It will be sort of a divertimento on some of the uh, ideas in here. And I have invitations. Pass them around, and if you have, don't already have an invitation, you can consider yourself invited. And you can listen to a bunch of good talks and meet some very loving people. And there's even uh, some special uh, inducement in this, in that uh, you get a free meal. <laughs> You know you're in pretty bad shape if you have to offer free meals in order to get people to listen to a talk. All right. Over the years, through the prompting and inducement of friends, most notably Ela, I have come to love literature. Perhaps even too much because I will read if I'm exhausted, because I find it so engaging. In fact, sometimes I will read literature before I'll read pure spiritual philosophy or before I will read psychology or even mythology. One of the reasons for this is it's that it's not so concentrated. And uh, what it lacks in concentration, it has in uh, life. It has the story element, the living story element. Because when you read something like uh, pure spiritual philosophy, you can get stuck on one sentence. I've, uh, or psychology, there are pages by Carl Jung that I've read over ten times in succession. And each each time reading it is 15 minutes. And sometimes you can get stuck on one word for 10 years. Like I've been stuck for more than 10 years on the word within. But literature is much more flush with life and it just flows along and it carries, uh, carries you along in the feeling of it. And, uh, Beside that, there are beautiful words. I think that uh, some of my best feelings I've ever had have either been in nature or in words, because it, you really can't think that people are anything but geniuses 
when you see what they have to write and how they say it, and it's just wonderful. It's also good. You can experience things that you wouldn't normally experience uh, by reading, and you don't have to go poking around in somebody's aura or reading their minds or anything like that. And uh, you can even understand your own society better if you see somebody writing about it. See, look at that. We're already through one page. Only 44 more to go. Uh, it might be long tonight. One of my uh, favorite pieces of American literature is a long novel by John Steinbeck called The East of Eden. And it's long and rambling. It takes place between two generations, between uh, two regions of the United States, and it takes into account several subcultures. It's got everything in it. It's about nature. It's about Steinbeck's relatives. It's about the settlement of the side valleys in California. It's about Chinese subculture and all kinds of philosophies and psychologies of death. And it's a great story. The story just, you know, it's filled. It's taken from life. Most of all, it is a story about the uh, Abel and Cain story in the fourth chapter of Genesis, as it is lived out in two generations of two brothers. The uh, In the first generation, there are Adam and Charles Trask, and they are sons, they are New England sons of a New England gentleman farmer. Their father was a highly honored military man, even with presidential influence. And he retired to the farm. And he tries to give his sons, he's a widower, he tries to give his sons a military upbringing. And uh, Adam is the one that it is most put upon. And Adam loves his father dearly, but he's a gentle of a gentle, very gentle nature, and uh, the military training doesn't take. Charles, on the other hand, is of a different kind of nature, hard, sullen, and uh, even a little nasty at times. But he's not the one that's chosen. He could probably be a military man. Charles exceeds... Adam in all physical abilities, and uh, he can even navigate through society better just because of his toughness. So you wouldn't say that either of them really fit well into society. On one occasion, when they're playing as boys, Adam does best Charles, and it's almost a, a fluke. And Charles gets so angry, he beats him nearly to death and then asks him to cover so that the father doesn't take it out on him. Eventually, uh, the father dies, and Adam does spend some time in the military. I don't know in what order. I don't remember. It's been a number of years now since the last time I've read through the book. He's not a great military success, and when his time is up and he's discharged, he wanders around the countryside, and he wanders into the south, where he is arrested for vagrancy. And the vagrancy title is a scam for slave labor because they put him on a chain gang. And every time his term is up, they release him and then immediately catch him again and uh, re-arrest him for vagrancy until finally he realizes that this would be for forever. And what he does is he escapes in the night and in order to elude the dogs that they send after him to catch him, he has to lay for hours underwater in a stream, breathing through a straw. He eventually finds some uh, friendly people, helpful people. They give him clothes, and he wires home and gets money, and uh, he uh, returns home. 
but he returns to an uneasy peace, even though uh, he and Charles are adult now and they don't fight, they don't get along very well either. And there's a lot of unrest between them. And at this point, another character enters the story, and she is what uh, Steinbeck describes as a monstrosity. Not a physical monstrosity with one eye or anything like that, but she's a moral monstrosity. She's very selfish. She's very uh, desireful. She's very scheming. And she's without conscience. And above all, she knows how to use uh, sex. She's uh, exceedingly beautiful, very charming, and she seems vulnerable. When her parents, and when she's a teenage teenage girl, and her parents try to uh, control her, she knocks them out and burns the house down around them and literally gets away with murder, and then pleads as a uh, orphan and gets aid and support. And with this, she eventually makes her way to Boston, where she becomes the mistress of a very nasty horror master. She's just not content with anything, and she does all sorts of cheating things on him, stealing money and everything else, building up a kitty of money. And when he discovers her treachery, he puts her out as a... Uh, circuit whore, where they travel around from town to town and they service lonely farmers. And uh, when she's gone, he discovers even more treachery by her, and he has her beaten and left for dead in a ditch. And uh, she manages to uh, live. And she crawls like an animal to the nearest farmhouse, which happens to be the farmhouse of Adam and Charles Trask. And uh, Adam especially is interested in helping her out in her terrible plight. And she has a very long convalescence, and he waits on her, and he falls in love with her. And she plays him for a sucker. And he proposes marriage, and she accepts. When, uh, on the wedding night, uh, she is, in a way, repulsed by Adam, doesn't say anything. She drugs him so that he doesn't even know whether the marriage has been consummated. And what she does is she creeps down the hall and sleeps with Charles, who's more of a man of her kind, uh, both Canaanites. When the uh, her recovery is sufficient, she, uh, she and Adam take Adam's half of the inheritance, and they move and to California, where he purchases rich land in one of the side valleys of the Salinas Valley. When they get there, they find out that Kathy is pregnant. And Adam is filled with what Steinbeck very aptly calls the glory. And he has this whole vision of a dynasty or something like that. And while she's pregnant, he plans and builds this wonderful Spanish-style uh, farmhouse lavishly in drills a well and everything. And uh, she seems to be going along with it. However, her pregnancy comes up and she gives birth to twins. And Adam is ecstatic. But within a few days, she has her strength up and she packs her bags and she's going to leave. And Adam is totally stunned by it. He doesn't understand it at all. And uh, he tries to get her to stay. And she says no, and he persists, but she persists, and she pulls a gun on him. 
and she shoots him. Not to kill him, but just to let him know that she's really serious. And so she disappears. And Adam is left in a lurch with two infant sons. And what he does is he hires a very delightful Chinese-American man named Mr. Lee. And Mr. Lee brings up the children. Adam sinks into an enormous depression, which goes on and on and on. He doesn't even pay attention to the boys, until eventually uh, John Steinbeck's grandfather, Samuel, who has been drilling a well and doing other things for Adam, decides that these children need names. And so he takes a bottle of whiskey, and he and Mr. Lee and Adam sit down, and they have uh, a naming bout for naming the two boys. They literally consider the names Abel and Cain, but decide that it wouldn't be a good idea. But they settle, instead of Abel and Cain or Adam and Charles, they settle on Aaron and Caleb. And uh, they turn out to have the natures of Adam and Charles and of Abel and Cain. Adam, who Steinbeck's grandfather, Samuel, who is a very wise man, a very literate man, considers Adam to be about as good a man as he's ever met in his life. He never really gets over his love. He never gets over his heartbreak, but in silence endures it and becomes a very, very strong man. Aaron and Caleb grow up having Adam and Charles types of interactions as they grow up under Mr. Lee. And a few years later, there's another drinking bout between Adam, Samuel, and Mr. Lee. And in that uh, thing, the subject of the fourth chapter of Genesis comes up again. And I want to read tonight because I'm going to have fun. Uh, I want to read it because it's a really delightful sentence and it everything that we've been working toward or trying to get to all along is covered in this. We'll start in the middle of the chapter here. Uh, do you remember when you read us the 16 verses of the fourth chapter of Genesis and we argued about them? I do indeed, and that's a long time ago. Ten years nearly, said Lee. Well, the story bit deeply into me, and I went into it word for word. The more I thought about the story, the more profound it became to me. Then I compared translations, the translations we have, and they were fairly close. There was only one place that bothered me. The King James Version says this, It is when Jehovah has asked Cain why he is angry. Jehovah says, If thou doest well, thou shalt not be, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not will, well, sin lieth at thy door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. It was the thou shalt that struck me because it was a promise that Cain would conquer sin. Samuel nodded, and his children didn't do it entirely, he said. Lee sipped his coffee. Then I got a copy of the American Standard Bible. It was very new then, and it was a different, it was different in this passage. It says, do thou rule over him. Now this is very different. This is not a promise. It is an order. And I began to stew about it. I wondered what the original word of the original writer had been that these very different translations could be made. 
Samuel put his palms down on the table and leaned forward, and the old young light came into his eyes. Lee, he said, don't tell me you studied Hebrew. Lee said, I'm going to tell you, and it's a very fairly long story. Will you have a touch of Mungapi? You mean the drink that tastes of good rotten apples? Yes, I can talk better with it. Maybe I can listen better. While Lee went into the kitchen, Samuel asked Adam, Did you know about this? No, said Adam. He didn't tell me. Maybe I wasn't listening. Lee came back with his stone bottle and three little porcelain cups so thin and delicate that the light shone through them. Blinky Chinese fashion, he said, and poured the almost black liquor. There's a lot of wormwood in this. It's quite a drink, he said. Has about the same effect as absinthe if you drink enough of it. Samuel sipped his drink. I want to know why you were so interested, he said. Well, it seemed to me that a man who could conceive this great story would know exactly what he wanted to say, and there would be no confusion in his statement. You mean to say the man, then you don't think this is a divine book written by the inky finger of God. I think the mind that could think this story was a curiously divine mind. We have a few such minds in China, too. I just wanted to know, said Samuel, Samuel, you're not a Presbyterian after all. I told you I was getting more Chinese. Well, to go on, I went to San Francisco to the headquarters of our family association. Do you know about them? Our great families have centers where any member can get help or give it. The Lee family is very large. It takes care of its own. I have heard of them, said Samuel. You mean Chinese hatchet man fighty tong war over a slave girl? I guess so. It's a little different from that, said Lee. I went there because in our family there are a great number of ancient reverend gentlemen who are great scholars. They are thinkers in exactness. A man may spend many years pondering a sentence of a scholar you call Confucius. I thought there might be experts in meaning who could advise me. They are fine old men. They smoke their two pipes of opium in the afternoon, and it rests and sharpens them, and they sit through the night, and their minds are wonderful. I guess no people have been able to use opium well. Lee dampened his tongue in the black brew. I respectfully submitted my problem to one of these sages, read him the story, and told him what I understood from him. The next night four of them met and called me in. We, dis we discussed the story all night long. Lee laughed. I guess it's funny, he said. I would, wouldn't know, wouldn't dare to tell many people. Can you imagine four old gentlemen, the youngest is over ninety, now taking on the study of Hebrew? They engaged the learned rabbi. They took to the study as though they were children. Exercise books, grammar, vocabulary, simple sentences. You should see Hebrew written in Chinese ink with a brush. <laughs> uh, it's a fantastic story. The right to left didn't bother them as much as it would you since we write up to down. They were perfectionists. They went to the root of the matter. And you? I went along with them, marveling at the beauty of their proud, clean brains. I began to love my race for the first time I wanted to be Chinese. Every two weeks I went to a meeting with them, and in my room I covered pages with writing. I bought every known Hebrew dictionary, but the old, rab the old gentlemen were always ahead of me. It wasn't long before they were ahead of our rabbi. They brought, him, they brought in a colleague. They brought in a colleague. They brought a colleague in. Mr. Hamilton, you should have sat through some of those nights of argument and discussion. The questions, the inspection, all the lovely thinking, the beautiful thinking. After two years, we felt we could approach your 16 verses of the fourth chapter of Genesis. My old gentleman felt that these words were very important too. Thou shalt and doest thou. And it was the goal from our mining, thou mayest, thou mayest rule over sin. 
The old gentleman smiled and nodded and felt the years were well spent. Well spent. It brought out of them, it brought them out of their Chinese shells, and right now they are studying Greek. Samuels. <laughs> Yeah, Samuel said, it's a fantastic story, and I've tried to follow, and maybe I've missed something somewhere. Why is this word so important? Lee's hand shook as he filled the delicate cups. He drank his down in one gulp. Don't you see, he cried, the American Standard Translation orders men to triumph over sin, and you call sin ignorance. The King James Translation makes a promise, thou shalt meaning that men will surely uh, triumph over sin. But the Hebrew word, the word timshel, thou mayest, that gives a choice. It might be the most important word in the world that says the way is open, that throws it right back on a man. For if thou mayest, it is also true, thou mayest not. Don't you see? Yes, I see, I do see. But you do not believe this is divine law. Why do you feel its importance? Ah, said Lee, I have wanted a long time to tell you this. I even anticipated your questions and am well prepared. For any writing which has influenced the thinking and lives of innumerable people is important. Now there are many millions in their sects and churches who feel the order, Do thou, and throw their weight into obedience. And there are millions more who feel predestined in thou shalt. Nothing may, nothing they may do can interfere with what will be. But thou mayest, why that's what makes a man great. That gives him stature with the gods. For in his weaknesses and his filth and his murder of his brother, he still has the great choice. He can choose his course and fight it through and win. Lee's voice was a chant of triumph. I won't go on any further than that. Uh, obviously, it gets at what we're talking about, the whole idea of freedom. Now we have to do some other reading. Because, as Jim pointed out last week, that we uh, were very unclear when we left the fourth chapter of Genesis. And I want to go over the first eight verses again and clarify uh, where, uh, where we made our mistake. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. I have gotten a man from the, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and that of and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shalt thou not be except. If thou dost not well, sin lieth, lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. All right, that's the first seven verses. I want to, to give you, I made a comment last time, but I didn't carry it very far. It's, the first verse says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, it's a pretty interesting thing for her to say, and the Lord is with a capital L. How could she have a child from the Lord if uh, she knew Adam, or if Adam knew her? 
In other translations, in apocryphal translations, the word Lord is not called Lord. In fact, in some cases, like in the Nag Hammadi texts, it is called a demon. And that is to say that the conception of Cain was, as we have said all along, when she was overshadowed by the Lucifer spirit and it lit up her spine and Cain was conceived in that manner. And that's why she, the word Lord here should mean divine being or demigod or demon or something of that order. And some of the apocryphal gospels they are very clear about the fact that uh, Gnostic gospels, for example, are very clear about the fact that uh, Cain is uh, the son of uh, a widow, meaning to say that the Lucifer spirit did not say, stay with her. Thus, you can see that the career and the character of Cain is filled enormously with the Luciferic desire. If it gets hot, just open the left, left-hand windows. I've got them unsealed, so all you have to do is turn to get them open. Uh, so, uh, so Cain is filled with desire. And it is in this attitude that he brings his gift to the Lord. And he is not rejected in his gift because of the gift, but because of the desire-filled attitude. And that's why it says in the seventh verse, verse, If thou doest well, shalt not thou be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto you shall be his desire. Sin in this case and uh, Lucifer mean literally the same thing. And as we've just seen from Steinbeck, and thou mayest overcome it. So uh, we were with, we were much too brief and just went over that too quickly. The whole sin of Cain was being filled with the Luciferic desire the pride, the uh, self, uh, uh, you know, being all wrapped up in himself, and it wasn't because of what he gave as a gift. And it's clear that the Lord is telling to him, because when the Lord speaks, it isn't like me talking through the mouth. It is an inner recognition, and it is clear that from within, the Lord is pointing out to him that sin lies at your door or that you're filled with desire and you may overcome this desire if you want. You may. So uh, it is very clear then that the uh, it is a story that uh, is uh, uh, about freedom. As the story East of Eden proceeds, Adam, somewhere about this time, gets the urge to write to his brother Samuel, who is still back east. Again, the Canaanite is to the east, only in this case, uh, the uh, Abel moved to the west. Uh, I'm sorry, Charles. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got the wrong name. And... uh, In reply to his letter to Charles, he gets a letter from an attorney. And it turns out that he is the sole heir to uh, to Charles' fortune. And the fortune is considerable because uh, Charles was sort of an ornery misfit and never did get married. And he put all of his orneriness into... uh, working the farm and making money, and he amassed a huge fortune. And uh, while Adam was already pretty well off from the first inheritance, the second inheritance makes him a very wealthy man. <laughs> He's extremely wealthy, and uh, there's only one problem about it. Half of the money belongs to Kathy. He's not, who calls himself Kate by now? Uh, but he is, it's not a problem to him because he's a very honest, good-minded man. 
and he searches her out to give her her share. In the meantime, she's had quite a different career. When she uh, ran away from the uh, uh, farm, she went into Salinas, and she went to work in one of the town's three brothels. And what she did is she suckled herself up to the madam and flattered her and wheedled her way into her in such a way that the uh, woman became dependent on her and lived in a euphoria of flattery and eventually turned Kathy into her daughter and heir. In gratitude, Kathy immediately proceeded to poison her to death. And uh, <laughs> a real sweetie. And she takes over the brothel. But it becomes a much different place when she takes it over. It is no longer servicing uh, desperate, lonely bachelors or men with cold wives. What she does is she purveys to the weaknesses of people who like to sell, sell themselves into saddle masochism and all other kinds of perverted things. And on top of it, she keeps photos of uh, respectable clients so she can blackmail them in case they want to put her out of business. I don't remember exactly how the meeting takes place, but he comes to the brothel. Adam comes to the brothel and has an audience with her, and uh, he's totally unmoved by anything. And she tries venomously to just break him down, and she can't do it. And he gives her the papers to her money, and he goes on his way and uh, wishes her well. Well, she's in psychological disarray by it all, because she's got a problem because somebody's blackmailing her that knows about the poison. Adam, being very wealthy now and having no heart for the farm, moves into town and he moves right next door, as I recall, to the uh, Steinbeck family. Caleb, in true Canaanite fashion, uh, prowls around town and he eventually finds Kate's place. And... Uh, she being in duress from the blackmail and all, and sort of liking him in his cunning way, they develop something of a uh, friendship between the two of them. Uh, but it's sort of a respectful friendship like you have with a scorpion or a serpent or something like that. Uh, you admire it, but not too closely. Uh, as the boys are growing up, both on the farm and in town, they make the acquaintance of a pretty young girl called Abra. And they both like her, and she likes both of them. And as they come into puberty in town, things become more heated, and she loves them both, but mostly takes up with Caleb, who is called Cal. About this time, Adam has the glory again, only this time it isn't for a farm. He has this ingenious idea that if you put ice in a train car, you should be able to, sh if you have a well-constructed train car, you should be able to ship lettuce all the way to Chicago or New York. And so he has special train cars built and packs them with ice and lettuce and ships them off to the east. Only unfortunately, uh, the railroad people don't uh, uh, follow the instructions on the outside of the car and they stand on a siding somewhere until all the ice melts and they rot and he loses a fortune. But Caleb, or Cal, in the meantime has, uh, under uh, John Steinbeck's brother-in-law's influence, who's named George, uh, he's, Cal has been working and he's been using his... Uh, savings from working to learn how to invest in commodities. And he makes a huge amount of money on bean futures. And when his father is devastated by the large cash loss, 
he offers him the money, wanting to please his father. And the father says, well, where'd you get the money? And uh, Cal tells him, and uh, Adam is aghast. And he uh, refuses the gift. He says, I don't want that kind of money. And uh, Cain, uh, Caleb is all terribly broken up about all of this, and he's feeling insecure, and he's jealous and everything else. And it's the night of the county fair, and what he does is he gets his brother, uh, Aaron, and he takes him and he shows her Kathy and Kathy's place. And his brother freaks out. He can't handle it. He runs off into the night and he disappears. Eventually they find out that he has lied about his age and entered the army and he is uh, sent to the front. And uh, when he's on the front, he sends a letter and that letter comes followed shortly after by the official letter that he has been killed in service. And Adam has a stroke. And he's laying on his deathbed. And Caleb is mortified. And uh, that's where we will read the last chapter, which is probably one of the more powerful pieces in all of American literature. And it really does hit at the... Uh, feeling side of what we've been trying to get at all year. The light of the kitchen poured down on them. Lee had lighted the oven to warm the chilly air. She made me come, said Cal. Of course she did. I knew she would. Abra said he would have come by himself. We'll never know of that, said Lee. He left the kitchen and in a moment he returned. He's still sleeping. Lee set a little stone bottle and three translucent cups on the table. I remember that, said Cal. You ought to, Lee poured the dark liquor. Just sip it and let it run around your tongue. Abra put her elbows on the kitchen table. Help him, she said. You can accept things, Lee. Help him. I don't know whether I can accept things or not, said Lee. I've never had a chance to try. I've always found myself with some not less uncertain, but less able to take care of uncertainty. I've had to do my weeping alone. Weeping? You? He said, when Samuel Hamilton died, the world went out like a candle. I relighted it to see his lovely creations. I saw his children tossed and torn and destroyed through some vengeful, as though some vengefulness was at work. Let the knock, nug, ka, pee run back on your tongue. He went on. I had to find my stupidities for myself. These were my stupidities. I thought the good are destroyed while the evil survive and prosper. I thought that once an angry and disgusted God poured molten fire from a crucible to destroy or to purify his little handwork of mud. I thought I had inherited both the scars of the fire and the impurities which made the fire necessary. All inherited, I thought. All inherited. Do you feel that way? I think so, said Cal. I don't know, said Abra. Lee shook his head. That isn't good enough. That isn't good enough thinking. Maybe, and he was silent, Cal felt the heat of the liquor in his stomach. Maybe what, Lee? Maybe you'll come to know that every man in his generation is refired. Does a craftsman, even in his old age, lose his hunger to make a perfect cup thin, strong, plant translucent? He held his cup to the light. All impurities burned out and ready for a glorious flux, and for that, more fire. And then either the slag heap, or perhaps what no one in the world ever quite gives up, perfection. He drained his cup and said loudly, Cal, listen to me. Can you think whatever made us would stop trying? I can't take it in, Cal said. Not now I can't. 
The heavy steps of the nurse sounded in the living room. She billowed through the door and looked at Abra, elbows on the table, holding her cheeks between her palms. The nurse said, Have you got a pitcher? They get thirsty. I like to keep a pitcher of water handy. You see, she explained, they breathe through their mouths. Is he awake? Lee asked. There's a pitcher. Oh, yes, he's awake and rested. I washed his face and combed his hair. He's a good patient. He tried to smile at me. Lee, Lee stood up. Come along, Cal. I want you to come too, Abra. You have to come. The nurse filled the pitcher at the sink and scurried ahead of them. When they trooped into the bedroom, Adam was propped high on his pillows. His white hands lay palms down on either side of him, and the sinews from knuckle to wrist were drawn tight. His face was waxed. His sharp features were sharpened. His breath, slow, he breathed slowly between pale lips. His blue eyes reflected back the night light focused on his head. Cal, Lee and Cal and Abra stood at the foot of the bed. Adam's eyes moved slowly from one face to the other. His lips moved just a little in greeting. The nurse said, There he is. Doesn't he look nice? He's my darling. He's my sugar pie. Hush, said Lee. I won't have you tiring my patient. Get out of the room, said Lee. I'll have to report this to the doctor. Lee whirled toward her. Go out of the room and close the door. Go write your report. I'm not in the habit of taking orders from chinks. Cal said, go out now and close the door. She slammed the door just loud enough to register her anger. At Lee said, Adam, I don't know what you can hear or understand. When you had the numbness in your hand, your eyes refused to read. I found out everything I could, but some things no one knew but you can know. You may behind your eyes be alert and keen, or you may be living in a confused gray dream. You may, like a newborn child, perceive only light and movement. There is damage in your brain, and it may be that you are a new thing in the world. Your kindness may be meanness now, your bleak honesty fretful and conniving. No one knows these things except you, Adam. Can you hear me? The blue eyes wavered, closed slowly, then opened. Lee said, Thank you, Adam. I know how hard it is. I am going to ask you to do a much harder thing. Here is your son, Caleb. Your only son. Look at him, Adam. The pale eyes looked until they found Cal. Cal's mouth moved dryly and made no sound. Lee's voice cut in. I don't know how long you will live, Adam. Maybe a long time. Maybe an hour. But your son will live. He will marry, and his children will be the only remnant of you. Lee wiped his eyes with his fingers. He did a thing in anger, Adam, because you thought, because he thought you had rejected him. The result of his anger is that his brother and your son is dead. Cal said, Lee, you can't. I have to, said Lee. If it kills him, I have to. I have the choice. And he smiled sadly and quoted, If there's blame, it's my blame. Lee's shoulders straightened. He said sharply, Your son is, with, is marked with guilt out of himself, out of himself almost more than he can bear. Don't crush him with rejection. Don't crush him, Adam. Lee's breath whistled in his throat. Adam, give him your blessing. Don't leave him alone with his guilt. Adam, can you hear me? Give, oh, give him your blessing. A terrible brightness shone in Adam's eyes, and he closed them, and he kept them closed. A wrinkle formed between his brows. Lee said, help him. Adam, help him. Give him his chance. Let him be free. 
That's all a man has over the beasts. Free him. Bless him. The whole bed seemed to shake under the concentration. Adam's breath came and went with effort. Slowly his right hand lifted, lifted an inch, then fell back. Lee's face was haggard. He moved to the head of the bed and wiped the sick man's damp face with the edge of the sheet. Then he looked down at the closed eyes. Lee whispered, Thank you, Adam. Thank you, my friend. Can you move your lips? Make your lips form his name. Adam looked up with weak weariness. His lips parted and failed and tried again. Then his lungs filled. He expelled the air, and his lips combed the rushing sigh. His whispered words seemed to hang in the air. Tim shall. He opened his eyes and slept. Oh. All of our complex philosophical analysis and all of the hope of rising from the fall, the whole task of redemption, comes down to one thing, the very thing that got us into it all, freedom. We were weak, we were vulnerable, and we didn't, but we didn't have to submit to temptation. No matter how glamorous it was made to appear to us, no matter how appealing the package, we didn't have to enter into sin. We freely chose so. It was the beginning of our divinity. The central focus of the universal spirit could not or would not and did not assert its power to inhibit us. It recognized an equality in pure spirit with itself. And we were given the choice to fall if we wanted. And that freedom has never been absent at any step of the way. We are free every moment, all the way into our downswing into matter, into deeper and deeper degradation, following a logical arc that we followed into greater depravity. We were free at every step of the way. Freedom is intrinsic to our spiritual nature, and it is imperative to our condition because our condition is bondage. Sin is binding. I don't think any of us needs to be preached at about sexual dependence or sexual need or sexual bonds or slavery to sexual desire. We've all experienced that. With mystical philosophy, we learn more sophisticated things. We learn that our etheric bodies interflow and join with another so that we actually do become almost of one flesh. So that we are completely open to another's thoughts and feelings because we have the ability to do so. And in such a bound condition, with such responsibilities, freedom is necessary. We know that in our psychology, through shared or through com complicity, shared guilt, we are bound to each other. Bound to people where we would repulse each other as much as we love each other. So freedom is imperative. It's almost like we're slaves to everything we've set into uh, motion. The second sin, the sin of violence, sex and violence, is also binding. 
It isn't binding just by cause and consequence, which is a big binding in itself. If we take away opportunities to life for others, we're bound to them to give them back what they didn't have. But there is a tremendously strong binding in the taking of blood. It is an occult fact that anyone that is entered into an evil order uh, is brought into that order as a member by a shared act of blood. That at the initiation into an evil organization, there is the commission of the second sin. So complicity is even stronger there. It's equally obvious that we are bound in materialism. We focus on objects. We're in love with all those beautiful things. We have needs and we have wants. But we get bound to those objects and we get bound so senselessly that we become numb and we don't even enjoy the objects when we have them. And we have a stupid binding. So we're bond slaves. But we don't have to be. Thou mayest overcome. At any moment, we are always free if we will. We can always give ourselves to any object. And when we give, we are taken away from the binding desire. Both things are improved, the object and ourselves. At any given moment, we can indulge if we want to, or we can choose to do something better. Freedom doesn't mean disengagement from life. It doesn't mean inaction. It doesn't mean non-participation. It means that we freely create right within the stuff of life. We live in freedom, and freedom lives in us if we choose. A very good example was the one that was brought up at the last meeting by Jerry. As everybody was walking out the door, he wanted to know what our connection was with the animals. We talked a little bit about that last time when we said that it was very likely that the uh, flip side of the binding of the blood has a releasing or a freeing quality. And we said that because so many animals are slaughtered and leave the uh, body right straight out of the flowing blood, they aren't as attached to the world. And so the chain of fall that began with the Lucifers back in the old moon period, when they chose to uh, do their own thing, and separated themselves from the rest of the angels and fell, they passed it on to us. And we fell deeper into matter, and we hardened in matter. And there was the danger of uh, the same thing happening to the animals. But by the letting of the blood, the animals get free, so that chain is broken. But there is more to it than that. The animals are losing a lot of experience by having their lives cut short. They don't experience a full cycle of life. And there is no substitute for experience. It is even more than that. We've carried the animals deeper into matter so that they, innocent as they are, are subject to all kinds of diseases, cancers, and other things uh, in their association with us. We've weakened them in some ways. It is our evol evolutionary duty to make it up to them. But in the making up, we have even more to make up than that experience. Because we have treated the animals as selfish objects for our own desires. And we have not allowed 
the animals to be what they were intended to be for their good and for the ends of evolution. So if you look at animals, most domesticated animals are ugly. You see a wild animal, it's never ugly. We have cows that have to wear bras, and we have animals that are so fat that they can't, they can hardly move. And we keep uh, animals in, you know, like chickens, we keep in cages so they have a lifespan one third of their normal life. And we make all of them sleep in their own shit. And that isn't, uh, uh, that isn't uh, what is intended. We've done similar things to the plants. Uh, even though we're talking mostly about the animals, so that the food that we derive from the animals is actually hate food. And despite the fact that we fortify it, it isn't fortified at all. It's, it's, it's weak. So we are bound to the animals by blood ties. And we have a cold redemption with them. And we have to give to them what they have lost. Not only the amount of experience, but the kind of experience. And this is really beautiful. In our duties is how we become free. If we focus on the archetypes, the divine thoughts created by the divine mind through the divinities for the intended experience of animals and see what was in it for the animals, or what was intended to be in it for the animals, we can, from where we are, bring them compensatory experiences. And we cannot raise ourselves without raising them. It doesn't necessarily mean something really sophisticated or complicated, but if we try and just ask simple questions in ourselves, like, what do these animals need, or how can I help them to fulfill their evolution, we can think of things. We can create. We are free. Thou mayest overcome by giving freely. Now, it's a curious thing. I find it curious anyway, that there is a similar binding when we look the other direction in the evolutionary ladder. Simply stated, we are also bonded to the Lucifers. We are, we are, what's the word now, codependent with the Lucifers. They need us and we need them, but they need us more. This is one of those cases where the trappers might get caught in their own trap. They may be uh, carried along by their own trap so that they end up where they never thought they would. Now, our binding with the Lucifers is a much different kind of binding than the binding with the animals. It's psycho-spiritual. It's much more like the binding that comes with a hypnotist and a subject. And there is a psychic interchange. But the fact is that they have so separated themselves from their intended evolutionary experience that even this binding makes them necessary, for, makes it necessary for them to have us for experience of any kind. If we recall, the Lucifers took themselves out of place and ended up out of time. That is, the Lucifers chose to remain in a place where it was warm and where the uh, rev of the high creative energy was in the central fireball of the misty nebula of the moon period. And because they stayed there rather than cycling, they got out of time by choosing to be out of place. When they tempted us, the opposite thing happened. They took us out of time by egging us on to do something ahead of time or before we were ready, and that took us out of place 
have put us deeper into matter and hardened us much more than any precedent is ever hardened. And the uh, consciousness, uh, the, the stuff of our consciousness uh, has even been hardened. So it, in our redemption, and that of the Lucifers involves our getting back into time with the evolutionary pulse. And that is accomplished in the same way as our working for the redemption of the animals out of compassion for their suffering and for their need, both uh, physical and evolutionary. It involves us understanding and tuning in, putting our consciousness on the archetype of, as Shakespeare would say it, what is a man. So that the more we can tune into what the essential quality of the human condition is and what kind of metamorphosis that consciousness is intended to pass through in its evolution to become and to bring out all of the qualities that have been built into us meticulously by all of the divinities over millions and millions of years, it is a matter of tuning in on those thoughts. Those archetypes are thoughts that are creative, that the consciousness is or that the forms of existence are built out of. Right now, our archetypes are such that we don't, we aren't following the model as a prototype. We aren't living in touch with the cosmos. We're out of time. So, it involves an act of truing our mind. So, if we examine the facts of the Garden of Eden story, as we've been doing, we see that it was a matter of knowledge or a matter of truth. In some ways, the Lucifers did not lie to us. They glamorized and they told us in the, tru the truth in a way that it was, in effect, a lie. So that it is like when the mystics say that when Christ Jesus speaking says all those that came before me were thieves and robbers, he was referring to the Lucifers because they literally robbed us of our evolution and they steal from us all of their experience. In fact, in uh, point blank, in Matthew's Gospel, uh, Christ Jesus speaking says that the sin against the Holy Spirit is lying. That's quite a change. In the Old Testament, the first sin was the abuse of the divine creative energy by using it first out of time sexually and then using it for power in sorcery and magic and then for pleasure and all of the other materialistic uh, uh, for, uh, use, abuses of it. This is like saying in the Mars half of the sun period, the sins as we were swinging into matter were sins of commission of violence and we instigated ourselves to do things. In the Mercury half, we have more, our sins are more of mental distortions, of omissions, of deliberate reservations when we should do. So we are trying to understand living in truth, living in time. And let's go back to something we said before. We talked about several types of time. We've talked about momental time, which relates an instant to eternity as being a mystical time that is omnidimensional and omnipresent that by living into a moment we can expose, uh, living in an instant we can expand that instant or moment to the eternal moment. Some of the other types of time that we spoke about were linear time, cyclical time, and spiral time. 
all three of which have a progress. And that progress has a lineal-like quality. So that if we look at getting into time or being in time and accepting the passage of time rather than holding back or trying to push forward too greatly can be looked at two ways. Number one, understanding the progress of the dynamic passage of spirit as it unfolds in time and taking the next logical step from the past which sometimes doesn't even seem logical. The other way we can look at the same thing of being in time is not taking a step on from the past, but a step of accepting something new from the future. And in either case, it means that they are about truth. Accepting the reality of the future as it is or taking the next logical step in the trajectory, or like the gulf swing into and out of matter. It is exactly as Christ Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Again, freedom is what we're talking about. And we're told literally, be ye perfected by the renewing of your mind. So the archetypes that indicate the delineation of our art into and out of matter, uh, we think we need to look into them a little bit more clearly so that we can understand uh, what our redemption is all about. The term archetype is not as Carl Jung uses it. Carl Jung uses archetypes to mean something very similar to Platonistic ideas, and those ideas are found more in the world of ideas or ideational or abstract thought than they are found in the realm of concrete thought. We're looking at concrete thoughts, and they are complex thoughts that issue out of a central source, and from them they are the meaning behind everything that comes into existence, and that meaning itself lives itself out or works itself out through all of the forms that follow from it. The motivations, the actions, the impacts and experiences, the forms that we need all issue from the original creative thoughts. And those thoughts live for millions of years. So what we need to do in our own consciousness, if we are to live true lives, to step on from the past and to be in time or to accept the future, we have to understand what true thoughts are. We need to know the truth so that we can be free. Uh, how do we know when thoughts are true or when they're untrue? In this, I think we have to uh, differentiate as to what thoughts are or what truth is. There are facts but facts are events and experiences or perceptions of events and experiences. And then there is knowledge that we gain from facts. And then there are thoughts about the truth that is behind knowledge or facts. And that is what we're really trying to get at. Plato asks the question, is it possible to have untrue thoughts? And he was very serious about it. We would say, certainly it's possible to have untrue thoughts. But that is probably because we aren't usually thinking. What we are calling untrue thoughts are counterfeits. There's something like impulses from the lower nature that is made up of the lower mind and the desire body, a kind of kind. They aren't thoughts. What makes a thought true? I think there are two things that make a thought true. Factual experience. That is, if a thought is true, it should be able to prove itself through 
in the living out of that thought. It swings into matter in the same way that we swing into matter. And if a thought does not hold up, if it doesn't work in the proving ground, it is not true. The other thing that makes thoughts true is truth per se. And that's what we want to get at a little bit. Thoughts and the ideas from which they come are not ad hoc events. Neither are the arbitrary stipulations. They are forms or embodiments of the living stuff of intuition. The stuff of truth. When an individual is thinking, one is attuning oneself as much as possible to the realm of truth that transcends ideas. And ideas and the thoughts that come from them are informed by that truth, the common truth that is behind all thoughts. And in a way, there is a dual liberation in that, in that the uh, consciousness is freed from bondage or freed from ignorance or stupidity, which, uh, which is the experience of being involved in matter that has no meaning or to the degree that meaning is lost, we get liberated when we find the truth that is behind things. The living truth itself gets liber liberated in the process of informing objects. It is freed by freeing, by bringing that renewing life of truth to things. Exactly the whole means whereby the thinker, the self, actually takes the stuff of truth, that interface between the idea and the truth, how that is brought about, even though all of us have creative moments, I'm not capable of communicating or even trying to communicate at this time. It's very difficult. So, the pure imagination that is the stuff of truth, which conceives ideas, though it is not itself any of those ideas, is actually controlled by the thinker. And it's not clear how much the inspiration coaxes the thinker into thinking an idea or how much the thinker uh, forms the idea around the truth in such a way that the truth can't help but to enter into it. It really is, thinking in this sense really is a love match. It is drawing in the truth into the thoughts that we think. So. Thinking is a very deliberative uh, matter. So again, in all of this, we see that in the moment of a thought, even the littlest thought, we connect the particular of the mundane, of the phenomenal, with the purest of the transcendent. It's, a, it's a quite an interesting uh, process. So creative thinking is both deliberate, it's obedient, and it is disciplined. But at the same time, viewed from the uh, ultra-transcendent point of view, it is spontaneous, it is free, and it is voluntary. It strengthens and wakens the thinker. Every time we try to think creatively, we become strengthened by it. And the true 
spiritual self, our divinity become, comes more into its own being. In every instance of thinking that involves wrapping ideas and thoughts around intuitions, around, you might say, bundles of truth, though I don't know that, that that's a little materialistic, in every instance, one learns several things instantaneously. One knows the truth about something. One knows about self, and one knows about divinity. Any creative thought, we learn the truth of something, and we know who the knower of the truth is, and we know that truth as, as a, an attribute of divine being. So the truth is liberated at the same time that we are liberated. Thou mayest overcome. Now, the whole process of intuitive knowing or thinking has all kinds of nuance about it. For example, even in this world, there are various varieties of knowing or of bringing the light. For example, sometimes we see things and we know and we understand them intuitively. And what that is, is an intuitive recognition, meaning re Cognition, meaning seeing again. And when we know the truth of something, we know the spirit that was planted in there originally to come to birth at another time or to ripen to maturity. It's almost like, that's why I believe why that joke is so funny and people like it so much. It's a cruel joke when they talk about Ronald Reagan can now hide his own Easter eggs. Uh, because uh, but it's the same kind of thing. It, it, it strikes us as funny, and we laugh at the absurdity of it because we're actually all in the same boat. Because as part of the universal spirit, we are we planted or we hid the Easter eggs that we are now recognizing or recognizing. Sometimes the process of knowing the truth and liberating matter is not only a recognition, in some cases, it is actually a discovery. A discovery meaning something completely new. Because matter is the, in, is the interface between the unknown of the absolute. And sometimes in the giving of ourselves to something in hard experiences, we give birth to some new truth that has never been manifest before. And so it, the... the uh, coming to knowledge or uplifting things through knowledge. We're talking about the tree of knowledge is how we're being redeemed. So it happens that way. We're actually in, matter is, we've said all along, sin is stupid. We've talked about some complex things, but we've never said anything intelligent about sin because sin is basically stupid. And if you try, it, it, it's only some kind of weak rationalization for not wanting to face the truth in things if we try to give a complex explanation. We can understand the psychological state that someone gets in, like we just saw with Cal, uh, when he was outraged that his gift of all of this money that he worked so hard for and that he, as a teenager came into, uh, we can understand the psychology of what he went, went into but his action with his brother was not, there's no way at all that you could see that as anything but stupid, you know. And that's what we always do uh, when we look back at all of the terrible things we've done in life. We see that they're basically stupid. Uh, it is such a thing that some things, the things that are discovered in nature, must be stupid. Now, this is not, this is not the sinful side. This is just in nature, some things must be stupid. Because it's impossible to give a definition to the absolute, but the supreme being, as supreme as it is, as infinite as it is, cannot 
know the totality of the absolute, or it wouldn't be the absolute. It is paradoxical that it can't be. So there has so it can't all be known, but it can go on. A, a process of infinite discovery can take place. Then, in this process, the agency that is focusing either the recognition or the discovery knows itself. It comes to self-knowledge, self-awakening, and self-becoming. Now, self-knowledge is extremely important. This is why it was impressed on the doors of, or above the doors of the mystery temples, know thyself. Because the, the, how do, how would I say it? The, uh, Creative evolution that we're going through offers so much variety, and because we've deviated into uh, a concentration that is much deeper than was ever intended, the possibilities for falling are infinite. And some of them have never, ever happened before. They're unprecedented, and they're not within the scope of the plan. So the possibilities of being led astray and perpetuating the fall or starting it all over again are infinite. Yeah, but this is where self-knowledge comes in. If you know yourself, if you know what works in you, and if you know how you work and what you're about, you can then encounter things that are unprecedented and you can interact with them, or you can choose to not interact with them, in such a way that you are taken off keel, and so that the experience, you know, because if you try to plan for every experience, it's an impossibility. You can't do it. But if you know yourself, then you can be exposed to anything. You can be put into any kind of condition, and you can equip yourself extremely well. Self-knowledge is an important uh, thing for just continuing to exist or to go on in life without uh, continuing uh, our blunders if we know the influences that work in us. If we know, for example, when you start reading people's minds or if you have the sexual bond with someone that you actually can suggest to each other, one of the first things you have to know is, hey, did this thought come from me, or did it come from my partner? And the only way that you can tell that is if you know yourself. And then you know what influences are yours, and what are coming through the shared etheric substance with someone else. The same thing is true with the Lucifers. If we know who we are, if we know what we are, and if we give credence, if we respect the divinity that is in us, and we keep that proportion and that balance within our being that Plato called divine justice, if we do that, we know what is the influence of the Lucifers. And we don't have to follow it. You know, thou mayest overcome. So, as we swing through matter, we redeem matter. By discovering things, by recognizing things, by interacting with things and getting the essence out of them, we redeem matter. We raise it to a higher level, to an etheric level. So we're tied together with the minerals. So our redemption then is an uplifting of the earth as much as it is an uplifting of ourselves. Very much exactly the way uh, the statements of Jesus go in the Bible. So if we live intuitive, self-conscious lives, we are involved in the redemption of the earth. And because we have this bonding with the Lucifers, and even though we don't have to respond to them, they do have to experience what comes through us because there's no other vehicle for experience. And if we redeem ourselves and lift up ourselves, they get lifted up.
It's a really very beautiful thing. And in a way, we are sacrificial to them in the same way the animals have been sacrificial to us. And sacrifice usually never loses. I'd say almost always, but I don't want to be too absolutist about this. Um, in the way of self-knowledge, in order to really know ourselves, we have to be able to get outside of ourselves. People that we know, people that we love, we can see all their faults, we can see all their good points, and sometimes if we seem to be able to see them much more clearly than they can themselves just because we're objectively outside. The same is true uh, with self-knowledge. We have to be able to transcend and give our consciousness over to something which is beyond self. In order to know self, in order to be free, we have to give up ourself or give ourself over or give our perspective over to something that is beyond self. This we see, uh, we transcend the idea of self. An idea is universal, it works everywhere, but an idea still has limitation right within the formula that is its integrity. If we get beyond self and live in the truth, then we have a complete universality. And we can look then at an idea, even the idea of self and function as a self, but from that perspective of universal truth in such a way that we are always self-knowing, and the self-knowing is no different than knowing any other being, even the being that is the selfness that we transcend to, because we are without, within. I don't know how to say it any other way. You, you start getting the really difficult thing. So this realm, this unifying realm of truth that is beyond even the limitation of internal uh, structure of an idea, of a principle, of a formula, is a process of unification. And it's a process of unification by putting our consciousness into the life spirit, into the buddhic plane. Uh, the words don't make any difference. The truth is what really counts. It's a realm of pure truth from which things, from which principles are created. Everything comes out of that. We have noted in the past that this is a pure imaginative light from which all imaginings, including ideas, are born in a way that's analogous to the way all of our plants and animals are made out of sunlight. Even all the minerals are made out of sunlight. We have also noticed in the past, and we have just very briefly touch reviewed it, that it is a realm of selfness, a, rel a realm of Venus. It is where self comes from. And now we know that it is more than that. It is all held together by a truth, and the quality of that truth is a quality of love. It is always creative. It is always renewing. And the beautiful thing about it is it starts everything fresh. It starts everything new. It gives birth to it time and time again. One cannot know self without loving beyond ourself. But it, some of this involves contemplation, being absorbed into that in contemplation. But it isn't always 